Okay, welcome to the lighthouse. Happy to be back. We know we almost got hit with a hurricane here, so we have uh, whoever came out here. There's a lot of rain today, so thank God at least we're here. Baruch Hashem. Okay, today's class is sponsored by Nicole Batesh for the full shalema of Gedalia's son in honor of her husband, Charles Batesh. May Hashem bless him with a munah health and success in her son's trip, Nathan Ben Naomi, for the success and happiness of her daughter, Esther Ben Naomi, and Rafu Shalem of Esther Ben Rachel, not Rachel, Dubinsky family, in honor of their son's Yurtzah birthday, up to 120, may they have success for Gedalia and his Rafu Shalem of Yerachmel Dianam Tova Basha, Rafu Shalem of Maximilian Ben Melissa, Leunishma Kamela Ben Saoda, Minnesota, and Leunishma Tabar Fega Ben Shmuel Menachem Mendel El Hanan, also Leunishma um, Estelle Hadaya, she was sitting right here two weeks ago and she passed away in the building. Literally sitting right in front of me. Estelle Hadaya, she would come to every single class and unfortunately she passed away and, uh, in this building. But it's, I mean, right here in front of my face. And I'm a little traumatized by that, but we have to do it in God willing, her honor. And she, you know, she had a very, very positive mindset. Baruch Hashem, she went through, she wrote an article. And she really, really had a very, very positive mindset. May Hashem give her Nisham and Aliyah. And also, Rufu Shalem of Yerachmel, Diyad and Tova Basha, successive Elisheva Barabah, Gadi Yabba and Elisheva, Shef and Elisheva, Emma and Elisheva, Reina Maka and Tova Basha. Okay, today we're going to talk about addictions. We're going to talk about addictions through the eyes of Rabbi Nachman. And we're going to talk about many, many angles. I, I can literally make 10 classes out of this topic, but I want to get, just instead of going through the 12 steps, just to some of the concepts of addiction that maybe you've never heard before. And maybe these, if you understand these concepts, maybe they can help us little by little deal with our addictions and grow. I myself am in recovery uh, 20 years ago. How old am I? 20 years? 18 years? 18 years ago, I had a very bad gambling addiction. Lost over a million dollars, relapsed seven times. I know what it is to be in rock bottom, and I know what it is to be there. And I know what it is to be in ultimate despair, anxiety, you name it. And thank God if it wasn't for Rabbi Nachman's teachings and my spiritual awakening, I would never be where I am today, where I end up, I, not only that, I own rehab centers, I own rehab centers, and we have a beautiful facility called Evolutions Treatment Center, and we've helped for the past seven years, we've helped thousands. So you could ultimately, the trauma became the triumph. So you could see in life that uh, they, the great, there's a great quote that nobody, nobody great has an easy past. No strong person has an easy past. And there's a reason why, because, you know, endurance and pain build, really builds you, really builds you. So first I want to talk about just, just a, a couple of concepts. The, the, today's top, the books we're going to use today is, um, this is really a phenomenal book called The New Light by Rabbi Rush. And this book is really about building will, building will. You know, a lot of times today people know what to do, but they don't have the will to do it. People know what to do. People need, they know they need to exercise, they know they need to get clean, but there's a, there's a will that's missing. And this book is all about building will. And this is what Rabbi Nachman says, the main thing I want is, your, is will. And imagine if, a, if, a, if, an, if an addict, the person in recovery, just channeled his will to, towards recovery instead of towards addiction. Where would he be today? The will is there. It's just, it's, it's mischanneled. And ultimately, somebody in recovery, they have to literally spend the same time, the same amount of effort that they did to get clean that they, that they did to use. So it's not like that person doesn't have the will, doesn't have the desire. They have it. It's just it needs to be channeled in the right way. Very, very important concept. So obviously we, we've gone through a tremendous year. We've gone through this year, last year, tremendous tragedies after Corona and just a tremendous amount of uh, obstacles and pain that we've gone through. And you would be abnormal not to want to escape. I would say that. If a person doesn't want to escape, he would be abnormal. It, it's a tendency in life to want to escape. Like I said, you would be abnormal not to want to escape because of the amount of pain. The question is, where are we escaping to? Where are we running to? What we're going to talk about here is a lot of this is a lot of talking a lot about a bittle, surrendering to a bigger light, escaping to a bigger light, to a bigger picture versus running away from ourselves. We know that running away from the issue is causing more of the issue. Running away from pain is what's causing more pain. As we know this from Parshas Bereshit, when, when Hashem says, 
when Hashem, uh, Adam made, a, made, a, made an error. What did Hashem say? Ayeka, where are you? And unfortunately, this, is, this call is always coming to us. Ayeka, where are you? This call of where are you? Where are you? All the time is coming to us. And unfortunately, what happens is when we, have, when we use addiction, so we use any, any substitute to block pain or to block that signal from our Creator, we're literally putting our headphones on and our Creator is talking to us. Imagine you're talking to somebody and he's trying to talk to you and you're putting your headphones on. So what happens? The call has to get louder and louder and louder. So the call never stops. And that's why it's very important in addiction, whatever it is, or any kind of substance to stop or block pain, whether it could be food, whether it could be marijuana, whether it could be anything. If you're using it as a, or pornography, anything. It could be, if you're using these things to block pain, you're basically using it to, to block growth. And we need to understand where we come from. We come from a soul that's unlimited. We come from an unlimited potential in our souls. That means the, your higher self will never stop making an effort to make you into the best person. No matter how much, away, how much you run away from yourself, the call just gets louder and louder and louder. So once you recognize that, no matter where I run to, my Creator is still running. You could abandon Him, but He's never going to abandon you. And this is why sometimes we have to hit rock bottom in life to wake up. And, but the rock bottom is really love, because it's when you, you finally give up control. So Rabbi Nachman says here that pain does two things for us. It either makes us or breaks us, part of pretty much. Acceptance of pain becomes growth. Not accepting pain becomes, the resistance to pain becomes suffering. And suffering without meaning becomes despair. That's usually the thing. So right away, if we have an attitude of, like we said the other class, the other day in the class, we are growing through this instead of going through this, you have a whole different angle on life. To say, I'm growing through this addiction instead of I'm going through this addiction. I'm growing through it. That means I'm, I'm going to get a spiritual awakening versus going through it. I'm going through a problem in my marriage. I'm growing through a, through a marriage uh, obstacle. It's very important the language we use towards anything. Because if we use the wrong language, what happens? We end up, getting, we end up falling into a victim mindset. And this is what the job of the Yetzirah. We are in a world, and the word, it's funny how the word Ha'olam is the same word Ha'elem which means concealed. You're in a world of concealment. There's tremendous amount of concealment. You could see coronavirus concealment, this tower drop concealment. There's a lot of concealment. But if it wasn't for the concealment, there would never be an opportunity for you to get a reward. Ultimately, you need to have the concealment because without concealment, there's no reward. If you would have a soccer game with no goalie, there'd be no reward. If you would have it too easy, you would die of boredom. So you have to have this challenge, you have to have obstacles in life, because that's ultimately what gives you the reward. So that's where we need to take a different attitude towards our obstacles and towards our challenges. We have to look at them as something that, that is a chance for me to prove to my Creator. Very, very important mindset. The obstacle happens, the obstacle is the way. Rabbi Nachman always told us, the obstacle becomes the way. It's not running away from your obstacles, the obstacle is the way. And this is where addictions are rooted usually in two issues. We always say this. If we take Viktor Frankl's theory, it's a lack of meaning. There's no meaning in a person's life. He's bored, nothing to do. I would say when I was 21, living in Miami, going out with the wrong people, bored. Try anything. Lack of meaning. Don't feel a purpose. So that could be, a person could be tendency to, to fall into an addiction because of a lack of meaning. Something that became a little, as our sages say, became a, first it became a little spider web in your life, and then it became the rope that's pulling you. Or the second term would be trauma, the breaking of the vessels. How is your relationship to failure today? The, your relationship to failure, does failure make you or does failure break you? Very, very important. How is your relationship? Sometimes failure fuels people to growth, and sometimes failure makes people lose their self-esteem, and they lose themselves. But failure, I hate to tell you, it's part of creation. Failure is built into creation. It's called the Shvirata Kalim, the breaking of the vessels. I myself had many failures, 
business failures, marriage failures, plenty of failures. The only difference is, is we go and we go into the growth instead of going into the self-pity and the victim mindset. So this is very, very important, your relationship with failure. And like the Arizal says, failure is not a one-time process. Failure is not a one-time process. It's not a one-time process. It's an ongoing process. You start a new business, you start a prototype, boom, it breaks in your face. Now you have to fix it. You start a new engagement, the engagement breaks in your face. Now you have to go look for another person. What's going on? What's going on with all this failure in life? What's going on? Is, is God out to, to punish us? He's out to get us? What's going on? What's up with all this failure? And most people, we're not educated to deal with failure. We're not educated to deal with trauma. We're not educated. Nobody's, no, you're, you're, learning, you're learning how to, uh, man came from a monkey in school. You're learning geometry square, linear. What's the difference? <laughs> How's that going to help me with, uh, when I get smacked in my face in life? The education today, nobody's teaching people trauma. Nobody's teaching people imuna. Nobody's teaching people resilience. They're teaching them geometry squares. And this, and then a nutrition class. Eat two bananas and make sure you have a yogurt. And boom! Things break in your face you're not prepared for it. And that's a problem. Because most people, they, they're not prepared. They're not prepared for what, you know. Or, you know, you, especially the new generation. They... they, they they're on such an instant gratification mode that it doesn't take much to lose their self-esteem. They post the wrong picture on Instagram, and failure. You only got half the likes you got before. He's, in, he's, in, he's, a post to, he's, in, he's depressed. So you have to have a different definition to Asian, different, different definition to failure in your life. You have to look at failure completely different. If you want to thrive today, trauma, you have to look at it completely. Completely different because it's going to happen to you. It's just a matter of time. One area of your life, it could be in business, it could be in relationships, it's going to happen. You know, my son relapsed on cancer the second time. Where are you going to, where are you going to run to? Where, is there, where do we run to today? Where do we run to? Only run to your creator. It's the only place to run to. Any other, any other attempt today to run anywhere but your creator, you're just causing more of an issue today. All of these issues are forcing us to run to our creator. And this is, is very, very important. Your relationship with your Creator. How He created. When He introduced Himself, Hashem says, I'm the one who took you out of Egypt. I'm the one who took you out of Egypt. I have your keys. I have Yeshua, and I'm the one who took you out of Egypt. He didn't say, I'm the Creator of the world. You live your own life. I'm good. If I would, He would have said, I'm the Creator of the world. But the way He introduced Himself is, I'm the one who took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. So you have a tendency now to recognize your Creator wants some kind of relationship with you. He just doesn't want a creation. I can create somebody, you do your thing, I do my thing. But He wants to constantly, he wants to constantly have a relationship with me. So you're going to see when a person's in recovery and your person's in addiction, believe me, that person is forced to have a relationship with his Creator, whether he likes it or not. So ultimately, that's the greatest thing possible. Because the ultimate, it's the ultimate, according to the Arizal, the whole purpose of creation is to build an intimacy with God and to get closer to God. Forget about the addiction. If it's getting you to closer to God and having you a daily, daily, where you're dependent on Him, ultimately that's such a higher level than a person who's okay, he doesn't have a relationship with God, he doesn't have anything. Ultimately, you're a much more higher person. Never, you should never to say, a person should never say, my trauma broke me, I'm less of a person, my, I'm less of a self-esteem, my less self-esteem is shot because of trauma. Very wrong approach. And this is a very, very important lesson for us to have today. Because, unfortunately, you see today that when people hurt you, just because other people hurt you doesn't mean you have to hurt yourself. And this is very rooted today, you see this. Broken relationships, abuse. Just because other people hurt you does not mean you have to hurt yourself. You know, I, I can crash my car. Somebody can crash into my car. What am I going to do? Take my car and now crash it into the wall? That's practically what I'm doing. I have to fix the car. But just because other people hurt you does not mean you have to hurt yourself. And this is when you start recognizing, when you see that, 
you start recognizing life is happening for you. And we fall away from Mochem Kadnut. So understanding the two purposes, Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 268, about the meaning aspect, this is where Viktor Frankl says when you find meaning in something, suffering goes away. But when there's no meaning, there's suffering. Meaning is a big component in your life. You don't have a means to live. What are we here for? And Rabbi Nachman says this before Viktor Frankl said this. Viktor Frankl said this in the 40s. Rabbi Nachman said this 250 years ago. And he says, if a person does not focus on his goal while he's alive, seeking some kind of meaning, then why is he alive? What is he alive? What are you here in this world? What are you here? To get vaccine shots all day long? To run away from COVID? What are you here in this world for? I mean, what's the purpose of your creation? What is your means? What do you wake up to? What is your goal? Where are you thriving? Where are you running to? What's your, what are you trying to do? Today, we're, t- most people today are not creating. They're reacting to life. That's not the purpose of creation. Purpose of creation, you're supposed to be a co-creator, not a reactor to life. And it's funny, creation and reaction have the same exact words. Same letters. Either you're reacting to life or you're creating life. Same exact words, both, both words. Now the soul yearns to do the will of the Creator. And when he sees that a person does not want to do God's will, heaven forbid, she yearns to return back to her source. So let's say a person born and that person all day long, he's into himself, and he has no spirituality, has no growth, nothing, no, he's not giving, into himself, etc., etc. Then the soul, his soul is, is sick. Sick. It's dehydrated. Because it's not getting anything. You remember what we spoke about before. How do you really... How are you really happy? How do you feed your soul? Growing and giving. Growing and giving are the two forms of feeding your soul. That is oxygen for you. When you grow, it's oxygen for you. When you give, it's oxygen for you. But when you're into yourself and you don't grow and you don't give, and let's say we create the story and we live our lives like that, then what happens, we, 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 we deplete our, we're depleted. We're soul deprived. We're empty. Then what happens, this is the root of sickness, Rav Nachman. Because the soul says, what am I doing in this guy's body? Free me, I want to go back to my creator. The soul wants to go back to my creator. So the soul starts to, to separate from the body. And that's where sicknesses begin. The separation from the body is a sickness. Once the person gets sick, then he starts reflecting on this world. So ultimately, what do you need? You need the bitterness to make you better. That's why medicine is always bitter. Medicine's not sweet. Because the bitterness, when you take, start taking medicine, when you suffer a little bit in life, then your soul says, look, he, maybe he does, maybe he is going to have some kind of purpose in this world. Maybe there's something that he's looking into. Maybe he's contemplating. We know pain wakes us up. Then the person returns to him because this, the, the, the bitterness, basically bitterness sweetens the soul. Bitterness and suffering and pain are, are oxygen to the soul because it's a cleansing. Pain, suffering is a cleansing. This is why we always want to take the first deal in heaven. When something happens to you, you want to say, thank you, Hashem. Because what happens is suffering and, and you go through pain, what happens? It cleanses the soul. It humbles you. It humbles you. It makes you check perspective. Makes you become a different person. Ultimately, that gives you the ability to look outwards and look at life. That is the meaning of meaning. Not, it's not just about my body. It's not just about looking good. It's not just about feeling good. It's about doing good and growing. But if we don't have that portion, if we don't have purpose, of course you're going to fall into an addiction. You're going to fall into an empty world and it's just a matter of time when one, you pick up one thing, you pick up another thing, and next thing you know, you fall into a very, very deep, sta- deep addiction because of no meaning. And ultimately, because you're fighting so much to get back into fighting this addiction, that will eventually get you back to the real you. So you can see it's a gift. You go from no meaning to back to meaning. And the second rule, like Rabbi Nachman says, is trauma. Is trauma. How we deal with trauma, how we deal with the breaking of the vessels. I heard a beautiful video the other day from, uh, I believe it's Charlene, I forgot her name. I forgot her name, but she, she created a wig company. Um, I forgot her name. But basically, she had a very traumatic situation. Her, her, her daughter almost died in her, in, in her arms. And 
she wrote a, you know, she, she, now she influences a lot of people. She ended up becoming modest. She covered her hair. She came up with a wing light. Beautiful, Char Charlene Amanoff, I believe. Beautiful story. And she was so, her post-traumatic stress was the water. She couldn't see water. Every time she would look at water, try to take a, a shower with the babies, she would almost throw up. But if she looks at that water, that water didn't drown her. It, got, it, was, it, was, it was traumatic. But because of that water, because of that post-traumatic stress, she's able to change lives of thousands of people today. So really, it's post-traumatic growth. That same water now helps people today. Because of that post-traumatic stress, because of that pain, now becomes a fuel for growth. And this is why he always gave that mashal in life. Yes, chandeliers are going to break in your life. They're going to break. But the difference is, you're always supposed to build a bigger chandelier. Always put a bigger chandelier. Never to make a smaller. The purpose of something breaking is not to go smaller and lose your self-esteem and hide away from yourself. It's to go bigger. Because ultimately, failure gives you a new perspective. It's not to run away from it. It's to approach it. It's to approach it. When you fail, now you have to think bigger. Now you have to think bigger. Because ultimately, failure gives you experience, gives you knowledge. It's a lesson. That's if we handle it correctly. If we don't handle it correctly, then we make it about us, then we fall into a major, major, God forbid, self-esteem self issues, depression, and then we blame other people. That's what we don't want. That's not what you're here for in this world. So like we said before many times, fail fast, fail often, get the lesson and move on. That is the story of your life. Then you won't run away. Your post-traumatic stress will be your post-traumatic growth. Because you'll put the new chandelier, you'll put the new, you'll always have meaning in the suffering. So that's how ultimately how we have to deal with pain. Pain is, is pain is always a growth opportunity. And remember, life cannot be stagnant because there would be no reward. So you have to understand the rules in creation. If they're stagnant, if there's things are for free, if I don't earn them, that is ultimately like Rabbi Rush says is the ultimate key to shame. And what is really shame today? Think about it. Every addict, what happens when he starts using? All of a sudden, he's a very low consciousness. Let's say he's a, he feels a, a, you know, a consciousness of 50, 60, very, very low level. And next thing you know, he pops, a, he takes some heroin. He, feel, he goes from 50 to 500 in about 10 minutes. What happens when you get something for free? Shame. Can you eat? Can you get invited to some... Imagine you went to somebody's wedding and you didn't get invited. Can you eat the food there? Depends who you ask. <laughs> but if you have some kind of a conscience, even if you didn't, if you went to a person's wedding that you didn't get invited to, even if the food was amazing, if you eat the food, it would still, you would still feel off. You would feel like, I didn't really get invited here. There's a shame to it. Nobody crashes people's weddings, but there's a reason why. And nobody will get caught either. There's 500 people, 600, who's going to get caught? But that's the, root of, that's the root of all addictions. Getting free light without earning it. So what happens is, what do you think comes down afterwards? Shame. Comes shame. Because I just went, to, I went through an altered experience, and next thing you know, I didn't earn it. So if I don't earn it, it's going to lead me to shame. So this is, this is where the lesson in life is. Start loving the struggle. Because the struggle is what creates the vessel. So when you do get the light, you do earn it. Same thing. Why do you think there's such a problem today with pornography? Very simple. Ten minutes, no effort. All of a sudden, this person goes on 200% dopamine. He didn't do nothing. What did he do? He, maybe he broke his uh, thumb. What did he do? He burned three calories on the phone. And next thing you know, he got into a very high experience. He didn't earn it. He comes down. Shame. And that is the root of why you don't want things for free. The Gemara says, do not, a person who lives does not want things for free. Because ultimately in life, if you don't earn it, it will lead you to shame. So any kind of experience that I take, that is getting me to a higher level of consciousness without earning it. Easy come, easy go. And the go is usually going to be, not only are you going to crash from shame, 
but you're going to have despair and you're going to further lose your self-esteem. So that's why the importance of loving the struggle, loving, approaching life versus running away from life. Yes, it's going to hurt. Nobody's saying it's not going to hurt in life. Yes, you have to deal with those situations that are horrific, that are very uncomfortable. But ultimately, it's going to stay with you. It's going to lead you to growth. Instead of escaping that situation, which leads you to shame, shame, and shame, and shame, and shame. So that, that's very, very important to understand that any time you get something without using it, it will lead you to shame. So what you should want is not want it anymore. I don't want, sh- I don't want, I don't want things for free. I want to work for it. And there's no greater feeling in the world than when you start building your self-esteem by doing what's, ho- doing what's right over doing what's easy. That means we can't build our self-esteem by talking to therapists all day long. You need action. The therapist can identify the issue, but now you need to show some area in your life where you have to show self-control. Because otherwise, you're not matching. Unfortunately, too many people. They spend way too much time in therapy, but no action. Okay, now it's time to act for action. This is why our sages said, Why are you crying out to me? Move. There's a time not to cry out anymore. There's a time to stop praying. And there's a time to show that you trust God. People sometimes are addicted to their prayers, but they're just using them. No, you have to move. You have to move also. You have to take the risk. You have to show your creator that you trust. That's ultimately how you build self-esteem. You have to show. It's okay to hurt a little bit. Pain will set you free, but avoiding pain will lead you to, to, to lose yourself. So remember how your relationship with failure, your relationship with pain, must change. Must change. You have to start saying, I love doing uncomfortable things. If it's uncomfortable, I love it. You have to get used to doing uncomfortable things. It is the greatest reward in the world when you do something that you don't feel like doing. There's nothing greater than that reward. You know why? Because you prove to yourself that your mind is not your mood. I am not, my mind is not my mood. This is not my identity. I'm not a window waiting for the sun to come out so I could start running. I want, to, I want to run in the middle of the rain. I don't care about my mood. I'm not interested in my mood. I want to take action. That's ultimately how you build your self-esteem. When you build your self-esteem, that's going to lead you to real dopamine. What kind of dopamine you think a person gets when he all of a sudden says he sees it's cold outside, it's raining, and he goes for a run anyway? You, th- you don't think that's going to give him? It's going to give him the same dopamine that he would get with any kind of drug. So you can see there's natural ways to get these dopamine, natural ways to get this, and it's called effort and breaking and doing what's right versus doing what's easy. Today we all want to be easy, 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 but that's what keeps you in a slave mentality. Remember that. You have to do what's right, and you have to feel pain. Pain sets you free. Pain sets you free. Rav Nachman also spoke about the importance of how we talk to our Creator. There's a very big difference. Rav Nachman spoke about a broken heart versus, God forbid, falling into a spiritual depression. The difference between a broken heart, your bro- a broken heart is very valuable to your Creator. It's very precious because you're coming from a place of being lost. God forbid depression, God forbid, we're not talking about the chemical part, we're talking about the emotional part. It's a rage against God for not doing what you want. Very big difference on how you approach. You want to approach out of Hashem, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost in life. Help me. My heart is broken because of my confusion. My Yetzirah got the best of me. I can't see straight. That is a broken heart. Versus, why are you doing this to me? Why is my life like this? Why am I falling into this addiction? Why is my life? That's rage and anger. That gets you nothing but self-pity. And when we're dealing with any kind of addiction, we don't need self-pity. We need strength. Do you want people to look up to you or do you want people to feel sorry for you? 
That's the lesson you need. We need tremendous amount of strength because we have a hell of a battle ahead of us. But ultimately, if you meet and thank God, Baruch Hashem, maybe we, I think we have maybe 50 people in recovery working for us. They're the most wonderful people. They're the most wonderful people. Compassionate, easygoing, understanding. COVID comes, they couldn't care less. They're not anxious. They don't have to have control over everything. Things don't have to be exactly the way it is. They embrace imperfection without a problem. And they're living life. So you could see the reward for being clean and living that in recovery. It's a beautiful life. It's a beautiful gift because you live a different life. You're more open. You're more, you're more compassionate. You're less judgmental. You go out to help people. You understand people's pain. Very, very important. So the gift of all this darkness is a trem- you're, you're a different person. You could understand somebody's pain. So it's very important how you approach your Creator. You want to have a broken heart versus, God forbid, approaching Him with depression. Change my husband. Change my wife. Change this. Change that. That doesn't work. A broken heart is crying out from a lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Not knowing what to do. Being lost in life. That is good. That's a precious cry. Versus a cry and asking for help. Versus asking your creator, why did you give me a lemon? That is not a broken heart. That is anger. We want to make sure we know the difference. You're going to have a broken heart, no matter who you are. There's tremendous pain out there. How could you not have a broken heart? How could you not have? But a broken heart is always approaching their creator. A person, God forbid, depressed, He's running away from his creator. And he wants nothing to do with his creator. So those are two states that look very similar. Very similar. And they're very close, but they're completely different. One gets you to your creator, the other one gets you nothing. It's very, very important. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to pretend things are great. No, we're going to acknowledge the pain that we're in. But we're going to approach our creator not. And this is why if you see people in recovery... One of the things that I've seen that really help, it's not, you know, before I used to think maybe it's the get the best therapist, but it's more than therapy. First of all, when people come to a a recovery center, they start expressing instead of suppressing. Before, they're holding everything in. Now, when they go to, they're, they're okay sharing. They express themselves. Right away, when you express yourself, you automatically feel better. The second thing, instead of being isolated, now they're connecting with people. So you can see, instead of suppression, they start expressing. They, let, they pour their heart out to God. The Gemara said recently, the Daf Yomi, if a person has a worry in his heart, what should he do? What should he do? He should talk it to a friend or turn it over to God. Doesn't, doesn't say anywhere to hold it in. <laughs> Nowhere does it say to hold it in. Because what happens is as we hold things in and we accumulate and we accumulate and we accumulate, the more we accumulate, that becomes our consciousness. And then what happens is when we stay at a very low consciousness, then what happens is other people in life just trigger exactly what we're holding. Nobody can make you angry. You're angry yourself. People just trigger you. Does that make sense? The more you hold in, the more you will be triggered by people. That's how it works. The less you feel good about yourself, the more you'll be insulted by people. You understand? What you hold inside is what people outside trigger you. This is a basic lesson from the Baal Shem Tov. What somebody does to you, that bothers you, is the same thing you're holding in. It's showing us. God's showing us difficult people in our lives to tell us exactly what we're holding inside. So the more we let go, the more we let go, the less people will bother us. This is why it's the importance of, of a, a daily accounting and a daily t- a conversation with your Creator. Because you have to let go. You have to let go. You have to let go. Because if I don't let go, my day is all of a sudden triggered by tens of people. If I wake up in the morning, I let go. I feel great. I'm not going to go crazy if somebody cuts me off on the highway. But if that same day that I don't let go, and I'm holding resentment for somebody else, and that comment that somebody made, or my husband insulted me, or this happened to me, I'm holding so much in that God forbid my kid says something that I don't like, or he makes a mess in the room... The world is over. This is why people go crazy over little things. The reason why people go crazy over little things is not because of the little things. It's because they're holding so much in. 
And those things just trigger them off. Remember that concept. The more you let go, the less you will be affected by people's comments or situations, or etc. The more you hold in, the more you're going to be tempted and triggered by people. It's a basic principle of life. You let go, nobody will bother you. You don't let go, everybody's going to bother you. We ever have days that everything bothers us? Days? There's some days that everything bothers us. Everything bothers us. And it's usually not about the situations. It's not about the situations usually. What people complain about is usually not what they're complaining about. It's over something else. That the days that we let go, those days the same situation happens. And I'm completely a different person. What's the difference? One day you let go, one day you hold it in. And that's unfortunately, when we hold so much in, we become so overwhelmed, how could you not want to run away to escape? So every addict comes in with a tremendous amount of accumulated pain that they've never dealt with, processed, expressed, connected, let it in, hold, held, 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 and boom, boom. And their job now is to go, let it go, let it go, let it go. And this is ultimately the work, because the more we let go, remember, as we let go, we ultimately feel much better, because we move into a higher consciousness. A person who lives with trust, he lets go almost everything. A person who lives with fear holds on to everything because he wants to control everything. You understand? So the way you live the world, the way you live your life, the consciousness that you live your life will depend on how you either you let things go or you hold on to things. Hold on to things. Very, very important. A person who knows marriage and he knows marriage is a, like Rabbi Nachman says, it's a cycle. Highs and lows. Highs and lows. Then he knows if he's on a high, it's temporary. It's not all inclusive. Marriage is not all inclusive. You don't get free a free gift of a clear marriage. When you're on a high, enjoy it. Be nice. Everything's wonderful. You got a couple. You got a vacation for four or five days from heaven, but you're not there. This is not a permanent state. And then when you comp- everything looks like it's uh, you're in the middle of Palestine. Sorry for whatever comments. Palestine comments. I couldn't care less anyway. And when you when you things crash in your life, what are you going to say? What the heck happened? That's, that's a cycle. That's a cycle. Because remember, if things are too good in our life and we think we have it in the bag, then we start confusing and saying, I'm such a good husband. Such a, what a husband I am. What a husband I am. Arrogance starts coming into place. And then when you completely fall on the ground and you recognize, what do I know? Hashem, I'm helpless. I can't even, I can't even fix my own marriage. Then you go back again. You understand that cycle? That means if you have a heartbeat and it's going up and down, you're alive. People call me crazy. I'm going to go through this. I'm going through crazy. Just call me in the morning. What happened? You didn't call me in the morning. No, it's okay. It worked out. That's, uh, call me in the morning. I always tell people, call me in the morning. Call me in the, you're going through a wave. Call me in the morning. Been there, done that. It works with Moroccans, Ashkenazi. It's the same, the same rules. One is heat, one is cold. Difference. <laughs> it's still happening. But once you know that's the cycle of life, you know that already. You don't go crazy when it's down. You hang in there. You humble yourself. But when it's up, you know it's not happening all the time. Count your blessings, like we say. You have a couple good days, four or five good days in marriage. Count your blessings. Then you're not traumatized. Then you're not insulted all the time. It's a wave. This is a wave. It's a wave. Here we go. Here comes the wave. Here comes the wave. We want to diffuse it, not ignite it. You understand? Your job is to diffuse it, not ignite it. That means if you're going to go through the wave, let it pass. Instead of holding on to it and, and, and resentment and all that. Very important. This is, I mean, this applies with anything in life. Business across the board. You have to know how to deal with these waves in life. You have to know how to deal with them. This is what Reb Nachman says. It's a constant, constant yeridot and aliyot. Your whole life is this. The aleph. The upper aleph versus the lower aleph. You're on the upper and it takes the, word, it takes the letter aleph. The aleph has two yuds. It has an upper yud and it has a lower yud. Right? We know that there's two alephs in a... In a, in a Two yuds and an aleph, right? The two yuds, upper yud and the lower yud. 
And then there's a little slide. <laughs> That's you. Sliding downwards, sliding upwards. Sliding downwards and sliding up. It's your life. This is your life. Up, down. When you're up, thank you, Hashem. When you're down, hold on. When you're down, hold on. That's the, that's the solution when you're down in life. Hold on. Don't leave your place. It's the only thing you're required. The person's going through a struggle. He's not expected to win. Just hold on. Because this is the biggest, this is what we're, we're prone to retreating. When we're going through the very deep struggles in our lives, we tend to retreat. So that's why the Gemara says, retreat is the beginning of defeat. Retreat is the beginning of defeat. When you're going through a struggle, we're going through a situation with the, with the towers, we're going through all these situations. There's a call, something called, in Hebrew, called dom. Silence. Silence. That's the answer. Rabbi Nachman says, through silence, you will get the answers that, you, that, you, that have been bothering you in life. Through silence. There's a time to be silent. Not everything is, has an answer in life. Not everything has an answer. There's times to be silent. And especially, that's how you prevent the fall. Because if, you atta- if, you, if you're already prone to a very negative state and a negative mindset, and you already create now negative, you make it worse than it is, that's the beginning of defeat. Retreat is the beginning of defeat. That's why in life, sometimes, like I said before, you just have to stand in your place. A prime example would be, you're going through an argument with your spouse or something. I don't know how this turned into a Shalom Bai class. It's an addiction class. Who knows? The bottom line is, when you're going through an argument, you're going through something in life, take a break. Our sages say, Ramuna, Amuna, renews every morning. Very, very important how you, you, when you're going through a very dark situation, take a break. You can't catch a falling knife. You can't fix a roof when it's raining. Usually it's your emotions that are doing more damage than the reality. And that's exactly what the Yetzirah does. Don't forget when this, when this virus started, what were people doing? Buying meat and toilet paper. Don't forget that. The chaos. There's no meat in New York. Buying toilet paper, meat. It was, what do you mean meat? What was that to COVID? The whole world's going to shut down. And you could see how people, they're very, it's, not, it's in our genes. We make crazy, pan, we panic out of nothing. It's, it's in us. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't come out the right time. Complete chaos in lives. The spies, all of a sudden, they, they, they saw they, they, were, they, they had fear. All of a sudden, they said, the land is too big for us. Panic? What happens after panic? Complete chaos. When there's panic, there's chaos. So it's very, very important to get a grip on those situations in life. Rabbi Nachman also tells us that any time with any kind of usage of any kind of drugs, it's not the actual drug itself that you're pursuing, it's the craving that's giving you the high. Very important. Just like all of a sudden, they, a person wants to date somebody, and they're waiting, and the person rejects them, and they don't want to call them back. And all of a sudden, after two months, they finally get a date with the person, and they said, this is all I was craving? All of this for this? What happened? Shouldn't you be at the happiest moment at that time? You got what you wanted. No. Stolen waters are sweet, our sages say. The craving is what gives you the high, not the actual usage. So remember, anytime you start chasing, you're already lost. It's the craving. That means if I took any person, gave them the drug of choice, an unlimited supply of it, but they had no downer, they would probably say, I don't want it. Imagine that. If I gave you whatever drug of choice you wanted, unlimited, but you had no downer. No downer? What do I need it for? I don't have the craving, I don't have the craving, I don't have the rush. I never forget when I was booking my, my, my trips to Vegas, it was booking the ticket, uh, book, uh, booking the flight, what hotel, the preparations. So once I got there, this is all this craziness for this. That's in the Yetzirah, the says all desires, all, all addictions, all cravings, they're like, they're like sunbeams in a dark room. Everybody wants it, everybody's grabbing the light. 
And then once you grab it, it's nothing. It's empty. Empty. Gabriel Mazza says it's called the hungry ghost. A hungry ghost. It's never satisfied. You'll never have satisfaction from, cra- from cravings. So once you recognize that, you recognize, what am I running to? Once you recognize that, that every time I'm running after something, at the end of the day, I get nothing but air, what am I running? What am I running to? Then you stop running. Then you stop running. Because you recognize at the end of the day, it's nothing. And you start chasing what you really want. We start chasing infinity, not toxicity. Which ultimately what we really want is infinity. We really want to connect. That means using drugs is a very spiritual experience. But it's just not earned. You want a higher consciousness. It's not a bad experience. But you just, it's not an earned situation. It's not an earned situation. This is why any form, Rabbi Rush says, any form of mind-altering substances that a person takes, it's considered a vodizara, according to Rabbi Rush. It's considered a vodizara. What happens when you have a vodizara? What does that practically mean? It means you, any, any success in that area, you will have no success. It might look like a temporary success. Wow, it calms me down, but now you have paranoia. Or it does this, but now you have this problem. So we're thinking, now nah, look, I'm good. Did you see how calm I am? Really? You're that calm? Stop using it. So we think it calms us down. No. It's a vodazara. A vo- any, any, kind of, any kind of thing that you get without an urn is called a vodazara. And we know our sages say a vodazara makes a person angry. This is why I tell people, the reward in life is facing the issue, not running away from the issue. That's why I'm so strong against even food. Even food, a person using food to stuff his face instead of face his stuff. What do you think, the food is going to fix the, the problem? No. It's hiding from the light, hiding from yourself. Hiding from the truth, hiding from God. And this is why, very, very important concept, that it's not what, what you're taking, it, unless it's natural, such as exercise, such as proper, then you earned it. If it's earned, it's good. If it's not earned, it's not good. <laughs> and that's how you know after any experience, if, the, if you feel good after that experience, whether or not you earn that situation. Very, very important concept to understand. It's very important to understand, Rab Nachman says, your relationship with time. And I would say this is probably one of the most important things in life, is to understand time. Many times when people go through despair or they go through a very difficult situation, they'll accumulate all this time. What does time mean? Time, believe it or not, our sages said, it's an absence of consciousness. Time is an absence of consciousness. If I lived constant, and I lived in the moment constantly, I would nullify time and space. Do you understand? When you're having good days in in the day, you don't even look at the time. Do you? Time flies. They say, time flies when you're having fun. What do you mean time flies when you're having fun? Because time only exists in an absence of consciousness. Go on a date with somebody you don't like. Okay? I'm sure you've done that. And I promise you, every minute is going to be like, when is this over? That means you're not there. Go on a date with somebody you do like. You could be with that person for three hours, four hours, and you don't even feel the time. When time, when I start feeling time, that means I'm not aware. I'm not there. That's how you know. When we start praying, and we start getting nervous, when is this over? When is this over? I'm not praying. I might be praying, I might think I'm praying, but I'm not praying. Because the way you know whether you're doing something is if time doesn't bother you. That's why anxiety is rooted in too much accumulation of time. There's not, you can't possibly have anxiety if you're present. It's not possible. Because time wouldn't exist. And time is a product of an imagination. So the more you nullify, the more you're present in life, the less 
time bothers you. And the more you can change your life. How do you like that one? Because the more I nullify time, the more time, the more I'm in the moment, I can create the future. In the morning, I wake up, I'm present, I have a beautiful prayer. I'm not thinking about what, what I'm doing later. I'm not thinking about tomorrow. I'm not thinking about yesterday. I'm creating the moment. That's the whole point. You're creating every single moment. Every moment is a brand new moment. There's no despair. There's no anxiety. There's no. All of the negative despair and all of the anxiety is all accumulation of time and not enough present. Try this example. Do something you don't like. And you'll see that when you're not, you're not, you're not doing it, Listen to somebody you don't like to. Hang out with somebody you don't like. I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm anxious. You get start nervous, it's because you're not there. <laughs> and this is why the, the, as you, if you don't grow in consciousness, time becomes your biggest enemy. And this is where you see people in recovery. They come into the program. How long am I going to be here for? <laughs> Done. Relapse. Guaranteed relapse. Because he's not even there. You're physically in the building, but you're already saying, when are you going home? What you, you didn't even learn anything. And then the next day, when am I going to the other program? And this is what is the people, I could be getting high. See, what the ego does is always telling us, we're never in the right place. You're here, you should be there. That's the unhappiness that people have. They never, they always feel they're missing out. I'm here, I could be making more money in this business. And once you get to that business, well, I could be buying uh, cryptocurrency. Look, I'm losing out. Now I'm anxious about cryptocurrency going up. And then I buy a cryptocurrency. Oh my God, I bought it in the wrong price. And now I should be doing this. You're a yo-yo the whole, th your whole life. Yo-yo, running here, running here, running here. At the end of the day, where'd you run to? Zero. Got nowhere. I would say it's the root of the singles, cr singles uh, crisis. Always thinking we could do better. And then when you get to that, maybe I could do better. And then maybe I could do better. This is why I got married in 35 days. 35 days. Because you can, oh, the Yetzirah will tell you, you can always do better. You can always do better. You can always do better. It's, it's always the game in life. It's the chase of, of time. But once you're connected to the moment, time does not exist. Time does not exist. Then you don't need to, then you don't need to use. Because the, the pain is coming from the accumulation of time. The anxiety of accumulation of time. But once I nullify time, time is gone. The addict's hardest thing is living one day. Progress over perfection. Nullifying time. And that only comes through consciousness. There are some people that love Shabbat. They love Shabbat. They get into Shabbat, they're another person. They're nullified into Shabbat. Another person, they get into Shabbat. When is it over? Come on, how about, how about it's too long? How long is it? How long? They're not in the Shabbat, do you understand? Or the holidays. Oh, so how I'm going to die. You're not in the holiday. Because if you're in the holiday, you would have gotten the light of the holiday. Do you understand? You would get the light of the holiday. It's the root of everything. And that's where gratitude begins in life. Gratitude is in the moment. When you appreciate and you see everything brand new. Imagine waking up in your life and seeing everything brand new in your life. Brand new, like a, like a movie. Look, waking up in the morning and refreshing your moon every day and looking at the day brand new. It's, it's, it, you, you, would be, you, would, you, would, you would change everything in life. But when we wake up with so much weight and lack of time, and time becomes to be burden us, then we're always in in seeking always relief of pain. And this is where we turn to substances in life. But nobody's using when they're happy because they're in the moment. That's what Rabbi Nachman says, the root of sadness, the root of most sadness is, is addiction, sadness, depression, despair, hopelessness, which is not rooted in time, which is, which is opposite of being present. And this is why most, most unfortunately, people who went through trauma, they've had, a lot of times they've had to disassociate because of very traumatic things in life. So their whole tikkun now is to associate now. Before they checked out, 
to cope with it, but now you can't check out all the time. Now you got to check in. Now it's time to check in, instead of checking out. Checking out is easy. Checking in is not easy. And this is why Edith Eger says there's three steps. You have to grieve, you have to feel, and you have to heal. Grieve, feel, and heal. But if you look at Passover, Passover is ultimately a lesson in trauma. What are you saying? We're talking over our trauma. We're, we're talking about our trauma in Passover. This is what we're doing. We're talking it out. Pesach, you're opening up your mouth on Passover. You're healing from the matzah, and remember, you were slaves. But it's very, very important, guys, to understand how you approach failure, how you view it. The, our sages say the quickest way when you go through a situation, give it meaning right away. Give it meaning. I failed to make a bigger vessel. I didn't have a bigger vessel. God wants me to have a bigger vessel. Give it meaning and get out of your head. It's the, it's the constant pondering over the over and over, 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 over. And that's what makes you lose your self-esteem. That's what makes you lose your self-esteem. It's very important. You can't have, you, if you can't fix your relationship with failure, you will never be able to be in an addiction because it's only a matter of time where you fail again. And that's built in. So people that unfortunately they're so afraid to fail, they'd rather not do anything and not take any risk. And then they're further improving that I'm hurting myself because you hurt me. Because every time, remember, every time I stop doing something that I need to do because somebody, because I'm in pain, I'm now hurting myself. You already caused the harm already. But now I'm hurting myself now, which is worse than anything. And this is where the ultimate tikkun in life is to do the exact opposite of what got you into the mess. What exactly got you into the mess is the opposite. There's nothing greater in life and that will give you the more rewards in life than saying to your Creator, I am here. I'm here to face everything. And you put on a big smile and you put on some courage and you say, bring it on. I'm here. That's all he wants you to do. This is why Rav Natan says, why we wake up in the morning to say good morning to the sun. Because the night is darkness. The night is my problems. The night is the, is the trauma. The night is where I want to go to sleep from. I want to run away from the night. But when I'm waking up in the night and saying, good morning, I'm here. I want to rebuild my temple. This is exactly what we're doing in the Beit HaMikdash. What do you think we're doing with Tikkun HaTzot? These three weeks, we're able to wake up and you're asking, Rav Natan says, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, is your mindset. That is your dot. Your consciousness is your temple. And he says a person who has no dot, who doesn't have consciousness, it's considered like he has no... The Beit HaMikdash is destroyed in his life. Your whole job in life is to build your consciousness so you can build your own temple, you can build your own mindset. That is your whole job here. This is what the Kuna told. It's not to talk about something that happened 600, 1,000, 10,000 10, years ago. It's to talk about something that's currently happening in your life today. This is the three weeks. When you see, when you see a wall coming down, you have to think, what did you break in your life? What barrier did you break? What standards did you break? Everything you have to look at life, exactly, this, this is your life. This is why the Zohar says, life is a miniature world. It's not the, this is not a history channel. This is, life is exactly that. And the last concept that we'll talk about is Bittel. Again, I can literally give you 30 things about addiction. This is all we talk about. But ultimately what we want to go, instead of running away, we want to go into Tabittal. Bittal means surrender. Bittal means nullify yourself. Bittal means close your eyes to a much bigger picture. Sometimes in life, the pain becomes so unbearable that you're not going to be able to comprehend it from your logical mind. Your logical mind, there's no way your logical mind can even handle these, some situations. A family member dealing with the situation. Right now, they can't go into and say, oh, just think positively right now. That's not possible at that moment. It's not possible. 
What is possible is to surrender. To surrender to a much bigger picture that is beyond your comprehension. That is positively. Because after that surrender, you start getting answers in life. You start getting a consolation. The absence of, the absence of surrender, the opposite of surrender is addiction. Because addiction does not allow you to surrender. So there's times in life where you have to close your eyes and that's called bitul. <coughs> bitul means surrender. Many times in my life, <coughs> my son got cancer the second time. Think positively, Gedalia. I, I can't. Right now I can't. But I can sh- close my eyes to understand that this is happening for, for some reason beyond my comprehension. That is a positive way to deal with that pain. Right now I don't understand you. I trust you, but I don't understand you. That is called Bitul. I'm not approving the issue. I'm not doing anything. I'm nowhere. I'm, I'm completely making myself into nothing. That is called Bitul. When Aaron's son, Beit HaMikdash, first day of the Beit HaMikdash, Aaron's two sons die. What did Aaron do? Vayido Maharon. He went into Bitul. Closed his eyes. He didn't say it was good. He didn't say it was bad. He just closed his eyes. This is what the silence that we're talking about. This is called bittel. It's surrender to a much bigger light that is beyond your comprehension. And sometimes that's what you're going to have to do. And then you could start thinking positively after you get consoled from the experience of going into surrender. So when we tell people in recovery, we don't tell them to think positively right away. First, you need to surrender. First, we need to get you to look at the big picture because you don't, you can't think, you don't have the head to think positively right now. You, there's too much judgment on the person. There's too much dinim. That's the time where a person just has to surrender. Surrender, surrender, because surrender itself has no resistance. Surrender kills the ego. I have to go into surrender mode maybe twice, three times a month. Certain situations where I can't believe it's happening, but I don't want to remember. The worst is to get into de- retreat and defeat and talk negative and lose your muna. Shh. Quiet. Dumb. As Ram Nachman says, when you're silent, you will get answers. Silence is the beginning of wisdom. You don't have to have an answer for everything. And I think that's the call today that we're going through today. Silence. We don't know. We don't know. And this is a very useful tool called Bitul. When you go into Bitul, that is the opposite of an addiction. Addiction is, I don't want to even deal with this issue. One gets you a taste of the infinite light. The other one gets you more wake-up calls. More wake-up calls. More wake-up calls. So may Hashem help us all that we should use all these tools. The bread of shame, Bitul. Staying present in the moment. Understanding that the struggle is the key. Having a new relationship with pain. Turning our post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth. Showing your scars to be your medals, not your scars to be shame you. Opposite. When you go to the army, the medal, here's my medal. That is my post-traumatic growth. That is the purpose of it. We have to turn. That's what Imuna does. Faith allows you to turn post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth. And you'll see if it wasn't for that situation, that wouldn't happen. So Hashem help us all that we should all be blessed and told everything for, for the good. Any questions? Any questions? We could do a breathing meditation or we can have questions, whatever you guys want to do. Huh? Meditation? You want to do a meditation? Okay, let's do 11 minute meditation. Let me see if I got my thing. Hold on. Let me see if I have my meditation. Hold on. Let me go get it. Hold on. Give me one second. Um, do me a favor. Can you get it from my car? It's right in my, in my seat. Okay? It's the Bose stereo. Any questions before we, we, uh, we get the, uh, we get the uh, meditation?